My reviews and interviews are all over the world. But tonight, I am thrilled to be here moderating this Q&A for you with Director John Carney and the cast of Save Street. So let me bring you on out, starting with Cosmo himself. Are we going to get John first? John's going to go first. John Carney. Walsh Pilo. Can that boy sing or can that boy sing? And the incomparable Jack Rayner. one girl trying to leave there and I just pinned her against the wall <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I promise, just go back and she's like, I hate Q&As. And I said, no, stay, but I'll be really entertaining. So I'm going to be super entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> well, before I throw it out to you guys, let me toss a few questions out to our very talented cast here and our extremely wonderful director, um, who I am a big champion of and have been through the previous final film. Gives us the 21st century version of an MGM movie musical. Wow. And you we'll take that. Yeah, Arthur Freed would love this. Okay, <laughs> so let me kick this off to the cast, particularly to Ferdia and to Mark, because of the fact singing, playing instruments, um, music first love, acting first love, and how difficult was it acting and playing and singing at the same time? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, it was great. I mean, I couldn't believe when I got the stroll because it was so perfect. So I was playing music all the time and the connection was just brilliant. But uh, yeah, I mean, we weren't, it didn't really feel like we were acting and playing music at the same time. We just played music when we were playing music and acting when we were acting. But uh, yeah, it was really fun. It's a great original soundtrack written by John and a guy called Gary Clark. And uh, how, how would it not be fun? Songs like Riddle of the Model and, and Drive It Like Stella. Mm -hmm. And what about for you, Mark? Uh, yeah, I've been into the music before, I was into acting, but uh, after this, it didn't really seem like a thing of first love and dedication to one of them. It kind of came like they were equal to me after this, so it was like music and acting were, were like, were at this point, like my, my children. And I, I love both of them equally, and I love them <laughs> Now, what about, Lucy, you really get to play a very significant part. And anybody here who was around in the 80s and fans of all those music videos, which is lovely because I worked on so many of them back then. So you all made me feel really old with this film. But, Lucy, how is it for you to actually step back into the music video genre and play the, the femme fatale, so to speak? Um, I think it was kind of taking it from Wafina's experience of that, it was it was a lot of fun because her first impression of all of that is that it's kind of sweet and silly and like helping out this kind of dorky kid and it feels good to be wanted. So then I mean, <laughs> um, but yeah, but then when she realizes actually how talented and creative and soulful this person is, it becomes a whole new thing and it really accesses 
uh, in a very personal way and really opens her up. And I guess it kind of has that effect on the movie as well as it has that kind of personal connection with everyone. Well, now you mentioned Soulful, and it's a perfect lead in uh, for what I want to ask you, Jack, because as Brandon, you bring a great melancholy and a real soul and grounding and, you know, call it prescience to the film. You see more of what's happening than anybody, and you really understand it. How did you get into that, into that mode? Um, interesting question. Uh, I suppose <laughs> when when I was growing up, I had a couple of people in my life who played a similar role to um, this role that I played in the movie. Uh, people who were a little older than me, whose culture of music and their knowledge of the opposite sex, etc., etc., really appealed to me, and I was really interested in what they had to say about it. Um, and on the page, I mean, you know, the character that John had written was obviously somebody who had that kind of influence with his younger brother, so um, it wasn't so much a, a, a laborious thing to, to develop that. It was kind of all there, and it was just, you know, it, it was there to be portrayed, really. Did you really trash all those vinyls? I did, and it broke my heart to do it. <laughs> my God, it was self-destructiveness, and it's scary. Yeah. John, John, what were you thinking? When? To have him snatch all those vinyl records. Uh, I was okay with it. <laughs> they were all, all Genesis, weren't they, John? <laughs> <laughs> but, now, speaking of music, before we go any further, is there a soundtrack? That we yeah. can buy. Um, such a capitalist question. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you're going to give it to all of us for free. Um, there is a soundtrack that comes out. I think it's out at the moment, actually. Yeah. Mm. You can uh, download it or buy it. I think and it comes out on vinyl eventually, which might be nice as well. Oh. Okay. Okay. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's me. So, John, let me, let me ask you about the genesis of this project. Oh, don't say that word. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. For to get people to leave it, I had to. Um, how autobiographical is this? You do have a music background. You were in a band. You were a singer. You were a bassist. How much of this is part of your own story? Well, uh, it started off as from an autobiographical place, and then... Um, I kind of realized that the characters came alive on the page a little bit, and also that what actually happens in the life of a schoolboy forming a school band is a hell of a lot less interesting than what happens, than what you kind of would wish for it to happen. So you sort of allow the, the script to take its own shape, and, and, and it's not, I'm not too concerned, I'm not good enough, and I don't certainly don't have good enough a memory to really recall uh, uh, my life as, as well as, uh, when we need to to write a truly autobiographical piece of work. So it's sort of, you know, there's characters there, and there's certain episodes that happen to me. Um, like, uh, I wish I could say I went up to the girl and had the courage to speak to her, but there was a girl, and in my head she's called Rafina, <laughs> and she walked past me every day, and I did sort of form a band to try and sort of Did she look as beautiful as Lucy? Not quite, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what else was autobiographical? Yeah, I did go from a sort of a posh, like preschool or whatever you call it, it's preschool or, 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 or kind of like primary school in Ireland yeah. into, a, into a high school, which was a lot rougher. So there's those little bits of autobiography. And I, I believe it or not, lived in the 80s. I know that's hard to believe now. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that you laugh at that. <laughs> so the, the big scene in here is obviously the prom. Now, because some of you are not yet old enough to have had your prom yet, does this invigorate your dreams and hopes for what your proms could be like? We don't actually have proms in Ireland. Well, it's just for you guys that yeah. we did that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. We called that. I'm really looking forward to mine. Why are you laughing? How fun was it to do that, the dream sequence portion of the prom? so much fun. We, we also didn't have any lines. We didn't have to learn any lines. So we just went in and just like pretended to be a really good band for like two days and dress up in like the suit and have all these dancers in front of you. And you just, it was just really fun. You just sat around and had a laugh with all, with all, all, all your mates. And, and Jack got to have a knife fight and ride a motorcycle. <laughs> 
first knife fight. Yeah. <laughs> Came off well. Yeah. I don't know how I'll do against Tom Hardy, but. <laughs> how was it for you, Mark? Yeah, I loved it because they just kind of handed me a guitar and played the song, and they were like playing on to that. I just had to stand there, and they were like, just try, look. Like you're now very, very good at this. I was actually kind of go crazy on stage. I'm not sure it, it looked like I was going crazy, but to me that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 and Lucy, you guys are dressed up in vintage 50s. Yeah. Um, what did you get to keep that dress as well, which I know. Uh, yeah. Did you get to keep? Now, now that's that. not the costume. <laughs> Did you get to keep any of the costume? Did you want to keep any of the costuming? Let's put it that way. Hell yeah. All the double denim and all of that, that's in my wardrobe now. <laughs> I took home like three bags of clothes, yeah. so I didn't have to go shopping for like a year. Oh, good. <laughs> um, yeah. Mark, I'm sure you took that turquoise blue velvet home. I wish I could say I did. Was that I didn't. <laughs> so, I tried. I tried very hard to go, but I couldn't get it in the end. And Jack just got T-shirts and sweaters. Yeah, that awful <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So I want, before I open this up to, uh, to the audience, I want to ask you, John, your cinematography here is once again stunning. You have Aaron back as your cinematographer. Mm -hmm. What were your considerations? Because what's so key here is because you're doing 1985 period, mm -hmm. your music videos look like 1985 period. Right. And you contrast that beautifully mm. with the quote unquote present day, right. but then you also throw in the beautiful exteriors, you know, sailing, you know, yeah. in, in a boat. Mm. You got to captain a boat. I know, it's badass. You got to act, you got to sing, you got to play, you got to kiss the girl, and you got to pilot a boat. I know. <laughs> it's all downhill from, from here. Yeah, down. I know, I had to go back to school after that. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. No, so, it, so what were your considerations with Aaron in working out your visual grammar for this film? Um, I'm thinking now about that. I, there's one word that you said there that interested me, which was contrasts, and and that was something that we sort of discussed in in prep in the film was was that really the film is a. I mean, it, I don't know if that comes across now as much as it did in the sort of the original script, but it, it is a story of contrast, and I can go on talk about that for you know there's so many examples of that in the film. You get, for example, the contrast of the two schools. There's a scene missing, actually, where you see his Tony sort of original school, and they're all playing cricket. Obviously, that's been cut. But you get the contrast between, you know, the world of a, of a Jesuit school and the world of a of a public sort of Christian brother school. You get the contrast of the realities of Dublin and the rain and the the grayness of that and the eighties and the recession with this sort of technical world of Duran Duran and all the promise of the video and. Um, and then you get this other great story, which I really like, which is that, that you know, in a sense, Connor thinks he, he has a bad in his family until he meets Rufina, <coughs> until she sort of starts to trickle down, you know, these little bits of sort of very ambiguous pieces of sort of information that she's dropping about her family. Um, and it becomes clear to him, she's like, you know, I thought I had a bad until I met you, which is something that, that happens to kids an awful lot, you know, that they think they have, there's always somebody worse off than you. And, and that's a real life lesson, I think. So we wanted to sort of, uh, you know, to, to, to show those contrasts in the way we shot the movie as well. So there were very subtle little subliminal lens changes and ways we went about sort of doing that. Because that's what it was like in, in the 80s in Dublin. This Top of the Pops came through the television. Um, and it was an incredible, I guess you have MTV here. And it, in a sense, MTV sort of did the same thing for you guys. We had Top of the Pops. And we had these amazing, colorful storyboard videos coming into our houses. And they were real, like, three minutes of sort of pure, distilled escapism. Even more so than a movie, in a sense. You know, you got transported. And those videos were kind of amazing. I mean, that Duran Duran video is insane. Yeah. Um, it holds up today. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, and it was, those videos were made. I mean, if you think of the sort of the light bulb moment that those guys in record labels had when they decided to make videos, what a brilliant break for that was. You suddenly had a band that could be in a thousand places at the same time. You, know, you didn't have to travel, they didn't have to show up and play or mine. You just, you know, record the tape, uh, syndicate it, and send it around the world, and then the band are in every living room around the world. It's an incredible sort of marketing breakthrough. Um, yeah. Now, uh, Mark, 
Briefly, bunnies. <laughs> what's, what's this bunny thing? Thumbs up. Yeah. I'm yeah. Q and A. Yeah, uh, the bunny is basically Eamon, Eamon Griffin is a real person that John grew up with and he, he just loved bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I read the script and I said I love bunnies and I was like, I'm just not going to question this, I'm just, I'm just going to go on and say I'm going to love some bunnies. <laughs> um, did you love having the bunnies on the bed? No. <laughs> It's so funny that, that that question keeps coming up in America. It's so funny. Yeah. When we showed that film in Ireland, nobody asked about funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like nobody, nobody asked about funny in Ireland. They, they were terrified of me as well. They, they hated me. Like, yeah. In every yeah. scene, I'm not sure if you can see it. Well, you did kill them. Yeah. Oh, God. They, they were Why is it with you guys and bunny? Seriously. Yeah. They're cute. They're cute and fluffy. And you got little bunnies. There's a rumor that Eamon raised the Easter Bunny. I'm not sure how true it is. Well, let's see what kind of questions you find, folks, have out here. Hands, hands, right here in the front. Yes, I would like to ask to the director because uh, I thought a little bit about uh, melody. So this coming of age kind of story. So with the love story in the center and this chance to see the first love and walk in the characters and talk, 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 and talk about this meaning of love, so can, can you talk a little bit about the, the foundation of these couple of characters and if you thought about melody, or you like melody? Like the melody of the songs? No, melody, the movie. <coughs> melody. The um, melody. That, that's a, that, I, I don't really understand your question, sorry. Okay. I, 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 don't, I just don't, I don't like where you're coming so from. Tell me about the, the, the creation of the, of the couple, of the story, of the girl and the boy's love story. Okay. The, the romance. Story. Yeah. The romance. The romance. You're romantic is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I mean, the story is, is, is um, a slightly fantastical sort of story in a sense, isn't it? It's kind of, it's not, it's not really meant to be very sort of, um, it's funny, I started off actually making the film, um, do you know the English film director Shane Meadows? Yeah. I started off with like, you know, you write things down to yourself as a director saying, you know, this will be this means that, or whatever, just to kind of help you remember things. And I, I wrote down, like, what would it be if Shane Meadows made a musical? Shane Meadows is a great English director. He makes very gritty, very brilliantly acted films. And I quickly very realized that I wasn't as good a director as Shane Meadows was. And I, and I sort of dispensed with that. And I realized, actually, um, while there are contrasts in the film and the romantic story and stuff, uh, that it should be sort of a fantasy, in a sense. And it should be kind of like a... Um, <coughs> you know, a story about two people who meet, who don't really exchange an awful lot of dialogue, and they're kind of guessing at who they are. Yeah. There's, there's, there's very little information, actually, they have. Like, she asks him, like, three questions and the whole thing about it. But she's more interested in sort of the relationship with his brother or, or his parents, but she doesn't sort of pry. It's a very gentle, sort of childish sort of relationship. And, and that's really what I was trying to kind of recall and remember and reenact a little bit was, you know, just the that kind of funny awkwardness you have as a kid when you're when you're out with a girl on a date. Um, I just remember that so well, and it's such a sort of a, a romance, so much potential in it all, and it's very romantic, but also very naive and very sort of innocent, and um, and sort of pre-sexual as well, which I think he's at that age where it's sort of, it's all about ideas, and less about, you know, um, anything else. So I think, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see. Gentlemen, right there. You. Um, um, I really enjoy in all, all of your films. Uh, there's like a, a moment in all of them where the where uh, where like a, the act of creation, kind of like a, like a, it coalesces the film. And I was just wondering, uh, in, in once it happened uh, in the music shop where they're creating the song, and then yeah. I feel like that's kind of the point in all your films where everything it feels like you can settle down and just kind of like enjoy the rest of it. I wondered if it was um, intentional on that, or if that's just how it kind of came about. And if you think about that when you're creating the films, like if you did you want this moment of creation that kind of binds everyone together? That's a really interesting question. I mean, I didn't plan it that way, but it's definitely you're right. It's definitely a thing I've noticed in, the, in, in a number of my films that there's sort of a uh, a moment where a couple could go one way and it could just get sort of hot and sweaty and it doesn't um, and it becomes more about something else that they create rather than you know a kiss or a, or a, a baby or whatever um, 
Why is that appealing to me? <laughs> I don't know. I think I think I did bring girls into piano shops and play the music when I was young as a means of sort of seduction. <laughs> no, you know what I mean. I mean, like, I, I like like try and try and play music and stuff, and sort of use that as a kind of a thing to talk about. Or a, but I do believe that that that, that um, uh, I mean, I personally get very interested in people through their work. It's always been through their work. It's not you know that you just see somebody that you fancy or something like that. It's like something that they've done. And I, and I I do find you know when you start creating anything with somebody that 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 can become you become very it's very charged, and I, I find it very interesting, and it's quite attractive to me. I like it too. Yeah, I think it's kind of, and it's sort of the anti-usual thing of like, you know, uh, like just seeing somebody, like the love at first sight thing is so sort of dumb in movies, that I'm, I'm kind of quite bored of that sort of idea of like, you know, um, just, just the, 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 the physical attraction of sort of seeing somebody, you know, so I have to play the piano. Uh, so let me ask Fernie and Mark, uh, do you use your musical talents to get dates? Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Mark? Uh, I, I would never use it to get dates, necessarily. I, I definitely used it to kind of be like, oh, look what I can do. And then they'd be like, oh, it's not impressive. And I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> but I'll see him all the time. And they'd be like, Okay. <laughs> but realistically, what happened was I'd play and they go, You were terrible. And I'd be like, Yeah, I know. <laughs> he used all their talents. <laughs> but, you know, the talent, your musical talents did get you this gig here. Yes. That could be better than a date. Uh, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, right there, you? Well, I did. I, I actually weirdly, um, when everybody else in my generation was sort of watching Star Wars, um, I was at home watching like American and Paris and singing right. And I think I'm pretty straight as far as I know. <laughs> I don't know why I was the kid going home and, and, and watching Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire jump around. Maybe I'm, I don't know. That's my favorite. Good taste. Um, I was screwed taste. Um, but you know, it's like. Um, I think that I watched a lot of those movies and I really responded to them when I was younger and I responded to the sort of, probably the spectacle you're talking about, singing in the rain sequences or American in Paris. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to make a film that had that sort of structure, but, but was sort of disguised, it was dressed up with a different sort of set of clothes or something. And once was the first time I, I really thought about that seriously and said, how can I get eight songs in a movie without people realizing that it was in fact a musical? And I remember screening the film in this very theater and meeting people coming in, and I remember hearing, overhearing conversations where, you know, a guy and a girl would be on a date, and he'd be like, was that a musical? And she was like, I was totally a musical. And he said, I didn't go to a musical. Dude, I'm not going to know you. No. And it was sort of like, you went to see a musical, and you sort of didn't know that it was a musical. And I thought that was a very interesting way of having my cake and eat it, like making a musical, but without, without um, you know, firstly, exactly as you say, it's, it costs a lot of money to stage big musical sequences, so, is there a way you could just do it in a piano shop? You know what I mean? Uh, with two people, is there a way that you could do it? Like in Begin Again, for example, I don't know if, you're, if anybody's seen that film, but there's, okay. there's a scene in that film where they go to Times Square and they wander around and you know, we just did that on a handheld camera and we stole it. We didn't plan it, we didn't organize it, we just sort of went down. And it seems to me that Cinema audiences are sort of really ready for the minutia and really small little details now in a way that they mightn't have been in the 40s and 50s where they went to see films in the, the curtain, you know, the world was at war and this was escapism and they wanted to see something, you know, epic and huge. And I think people now with their phones and with the amount of information they're taking, I think actually stories get smaller and smaller and they can get smaller than they ever could have gotten before. And I, I actually think just, I mean, I don't know if there's filmmakers in the audience uh, but I think that now is sort of the time to really, um, weirdly, kind of make smaller films. I actually think that they'll potentially have, you know, there's obviously going to be these huge, huge movies, um, which are great and have a place and all that, but I actually think the sort of the more detailed films become the more interesting films are to me anyway, personally speaking. Well, 
right over there. Could you talk about your process working with uh, uh, a script that's so intertwined with music, and as you're writing it, and as you're like coming up with the song, how do you balance sort of that writing process as you're working out? The story? <coughs> um, I kind of, I kind of like, I, I have a, I have a chair with wheels, and I have a typewriter or, you know, like a computer on one side of my room and I have, as Jack will know because he shared an office with me for a while, um, um, there's like, the computer is there and then the other side is like a Fender precision bass and a keyboard. And I've always had that in my room for as long as I can remember because I have an incredibly short attention span. And I'd write a scene over here and I get so bored that I want to leave. And if I leave, I'll come back like five hours later and write another scene. I just can't get any work done. Um, so I scoot over and I play something on the piano, you know what I mean? Like I'll do something really stupid, like I'll Google a Billy Joel song and I'll just want to learn. Like, you know, just to distract myself from the monotony of the script writing. And that will lead somewhere in my head and I'll be like, oh, okay, that, that chord could kind of work in that little speech I wrote with Jack or whatever, you know, for, for the Brendan character. And the two things sort of grow simultaneously between the, the, the few months that I'm kind of writing a script. Um, and they inform each other. And on Sing Street, it was really interesting. We formed a band um, across the road from where we work, across the corridor, in fact. It was a little studio, and we put a band in there. And um, I would go between the, my, my office and the, uh, the live room with ideas. And then, and then we would come up uh, with ideas, you know, in the band. And I'd go, oh, oh, oh stop that. And I'd go back to the script, and I'd actually put the lyrics that we'd just written I change the dialogue and build it around. So for example, the riddle of the model, that's a song um, that grew with the scene where he goes up to the model. And so the two things seem really organic, don't they? They seem sort of really connected, like you couldn't, you almost couldn't sort of separate them. They really do seem like he's just met that girl, you know, she's bragging that she's a model, and he writes this song. So, so that's kind of the, pro that's loosely sort of the process of, of how I've done these two movies anyway. Right over there. Uh, for the actors, what was your favorite moment of the entire process of this film? Oh, to pick one. <laughs> so many. Um, yeah. Shooting the music, I really enjoy shooting the music videos. Like all of them, they're all so much fun. Um, we mentioned driving like stole it already. We, and uh, Riddle of the Model was so fun. I love the parts where we were just really, really crap. Because <laughs> that was just really fun. We just it was just stupid. Um so it was great. It wasn't it wasn't that stupid job, but it was like okay, it was stupid in a good way. And um yeah. So and I also loved the tuning the playing the gig at the end. The song Girls where it was really talking heads and really kind of robotic. And I got to wear a dress and David Bowie makeup. Um it'd be hard for me to pick one. Uh, I think for me there's two specific ones that really stood out and those were uh, the scene where Brandon obviously just snaps and he's had way too much of his family and yeah. like, you know, kind of just focuses all of his madness and anger and anxiety and frustration of his brother for a split second and that is the scene where he flips out and smashes all those records and I love that scene because you know, I, I think that it's fairly apparent that he's not really angry with his brother at all. He's frustrated to some degree at his naivety, but ultimately it's a scene of just self-loathing and self-destruction through destroying all of this culture that he's spent such a long time trying to build up. Um, and I think that music can be a trap as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, there's that too. But I think it's kind of a moment there that he turns a corner, and then in conjunction with that, there's the scene at the very end of the film where he kind of has this moment of liberation and, and total elation for himself when his brother, you know, when he kind of finds a way to, to, to kind of let him go and, and, and try to achieve his own goals. And um, so those two scenes, I think, go hand in hand for me. And those were my favorite moments to shoot throughout the course of the movie. And what about for you, Lucy? Um, like Friday, I really enjoyed doing music videos because it was a really fun to be overly theatrical and do those crazy costumes and makeup and everything. But one of my favorite scenes to do and in the script was that scene where Rafina and Connor are walking around that little park. Um, because
because I love those moments where Rufina just kind of starts to let him in and kind of starts to give him a hint of what her actual life might be like because it's half her wanting to for him to see her and him being the first person that she has felt that but also it's her challenging him because she's very comfortable with, pe with keeping people at a certain proximity and he's the only one that has tried to push past that and that she's been kind of okay with that. So it's her challenging him and like throwing little bits of truth at him and seeing like how he responds if he can handle her. And with her. Your turn, Mark. <laughs> and we know it's not the bunnies. Uh, any, anything to do with the full band, really, because like, the lads are just hilarious, especially Carol. Carol was 12 when we shot that, and he's probably the funniest man. I was the bass player. And the Cowboys. Cowboys. <laughs> he's, he's still, he's only 14 now, and he's still just as funny. Like, uh, all the days when we had scenes of the full band, like, like it literally could not be recreated those days on Saturday. It was just so funny. <laughs> Would you make a sequel with him and the lead? Yeah. yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he stole every scene that he's in. You do know that, John. Very yeah, good. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. But all of you are amazing. Do we have time for one more question, Katie? We love to try to stay here as long as you stay here. <laughs> well, yeah. there we stay go. Or there's another, there's they another film on. Sleep. One more. Yeah, one more. Okay, let's let's go over here. You right there. Hi. Um, so there was big in what there was a lot of improvisation that went on. Does that translate your other films? Is there room for improvisation in a movie like this? Sure. There actually wasn't any improvisation in once. That's the weird thing. That was that was that, that kind of a story that sort of we allowed to happen because um um I mean, there was movement around the dialogue. Like, I don't, I don't write, and I, I just, you know, it's not Shakespeare. It, it doesn't have to be read exactly the way I've written, but the scene, but, but there is a sort of a thing going on in the script that has to be adhered to. And it's the same with this. Like, I would, if an actor wants to say something in a different way, and, and certainly if they show me that it suits them better, and in fact is about, why would I ever get in the way of that, right? But, but generally speaking, you have to stick to a notion of what's sort of being, being, being said, you know, but I'm all for switch the words around, cough during it, you know, clear your throat, try and make it sound as naturalistic as possible, because back to the, 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 the first question, I, I make naturalistic musicals, they have to seem like the guys are really making it up as they go along, the music, I mean, it feels like it comes out of the dialogue, so the dialogue can't have a beginning, a middle, and an end precisely. Um, do you know what I mean? But, but they're certainly not, it's certainly not, you know, I think we kind of let people believe that a little bit with once, that we sort of were making it up as we went along, because it seems so like that. But actually, we, we, we did an incredible amount of work getting it to seem like that. Um, and I kind of like working that way. Your crew and your team and your story to be so organic. Like, your, your cast was so amazingly innocent and mature and experiential on the screen, it's hard for, I think, a lot of people to see how you could have done that, orchestrating that, not just capturing that as a fly on the wall. I think that is a huge testament to you as a filmmaker and yeah. the cast for getting that. Well, thank you very much. I think, I think I mean, it, raises very, it raises a very interesting sort of question generally about, about uh, why are we doing that? Like, why, why, why do we take that approach to certain dramas and certain other dramas, like a James Bond film, or the very opposite of that? But I think it's a really interesting time for films um, and, and reality. You know, to, the, the, it's fascinating. I think the next ten or fifteen or twenty years of cinema, I just can't wait to see what people. Are there any filmmakers in the audience? Wow, well, well, that's LA for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it bodes well for the future of film then. I would definitely say, yeah, I, I mean, I think, like, I cannot imagine, because in this film, um, you know, I remember just getting, trying to get a video camera in 1984 in Dublin yeah. was the hardest thing to do. <laughs> like, I remember the guy that had, there was, there was a video camera in our school, and it had been bought by the school, and it was in a glass, it was in a, it was locked in a room, <laughs> and I used to go up to the, the, the Christian brother who was in charge of sports, and, I, and it, it had been sort of officially bought to film sports. 
you know, and, and play back. And I went up to him and said, can we borrow that to shoot something, you know, like a horror film? He was like, that's for sports. <laughs> so I know, but can we, because it's not being used now or ever, <laughs> can I use it for five, that's for sports. And um, just getting, you know, first you're getting a camera, but then trying to make it look good. I mean, does anybody remember what high age looked like? <laughs> or SVHS. I mean, the funny thing is when we tried to do the Riddle of the Model video, like, we couldn't even find a camera that was as shit as those cameras. <laughs> you know? And we had to, like, wreck it in post-production to make it even look as bad. Now, I've got a thing in my pocket, which is, like, HD quality, unbelievable sound. If I had that when I was... In a way, I'm grateful I didn't because the technological challenges of making a film back then were just so vast. Uh, it, it kind of inspired me in a way to just figure out how the hell do I ever make this look good? Uh, but now, you know, you really can make stuff look good and it sort of seems like there's going to be a whole new wave of filmmakers out there, which I'm, I'm incredibly excited to see. Just just you guys now, I'm just leaving that with you. <laughs> figure that one out. Well, that is all the time we have. Thank you all so much.